All right, welcome to the School Psych Review Zoom webinar focused on promoting youth mental health at school, a public health approach to effective prevention and inter intervention. My name is Shane Jimerson, and I am the editor in chief of School Psychology Review. And these types of special sessions are here to really feature the high quality scholarship and publications, the articles that are being published in the journal, and really reinforce our efforts to bring science to practice, to make a difference, to help children and benefit families and schools throughout the country and around the world. Again, I just want to remind individuals watching that NAS members can easily access all of the articles in School Psych Review through the NASP website. There is a button you can click there that says View SPR, and it will direct you right into the Taylor and Francis website and will have included your NAS membership credentials. Those of you who are not NAS members can easily access School Psych Review through the Taylor and Francis uh, School Psych Review website. So all of these articles uh, being available through Taylor and Francis website, several of them are either open access, which means they'll always be available to all individuals, and or uh, several of them are also full access, which Taylor and Francis provides open uh, limited duration access for a couple of months. So just wanted to highlight that as you're exploring the content and as our presenters today are sharing information, uh, hopefully you'll be interested in following up. And those of you active on social media, feel free to do screenshots to share information out there during the time, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. Uh, we always want to engage our community, our SPR community and our colleagues in school psychology and beyond. And so feel free to uh, post information throughout the session today. And always know that these webinars are featured on the School Psychology Review YouTube channel, which also includes many 120 second summaries of the articles uh, both those that will be discussed and presented today, as well as many others that are featured in the journal. So without further delay, I uh, have the good fortune today here of uh, collaborating on this session with Keith Herman and Wendy Rinke, Aaron Thompson, Kristen Holly, and myself, and I'll let each of them provide a brief introduction. Right, thanks, Shane. So I am Keith Herman. I'm a professor in school and counseling psychology here at the University of Missouri. I also co-direct the Missouri Prevention Science Institute, and I'm part of the leadership team for a couple of the projects we're talking about today, the Family Access Center of Excellence, as well as the Boone County Schools Mental Health Coalition. Hi, um, I'm Wendy Rinke, and I'm a professor at the University of Missouri. I'm also co-director of the Missouri Prevention Science Institute, and um, I'm also on the leadership team for uh, several of the projects that we'll discuss today. Hi, I'm Aaron Thompson. I'm an associate professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Missouri and associate director of the Missouri Prevention Science Institute. And I also am involved in several of the projects we're going to discuss today. It's nice to be here. Hi, I'm Kristen Hawley, and I'm an associate professor in clinical psychology at MU. Um, and I'm also uh, part of the leadership team for several of the projects. I direct the Center for Evidence-Based Youth Mental Health here at MU, and I also get to work with Keith and Wendy and Aaron each day in the Missouri Prevention Science Institute. Thanks. Welcome, and I mentioned my name is Shane Jimerson. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of School Psych Review, but also my day job is a professor here at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And it, throughout my career, I've focused on looking at the social, emotional, cognitive, academic, and mental health development of children across time, and specifically focusing on the development of children at school, the healthy development of children at school. And this is an area that's clearly uh, close to my heart and passion as a scholar, uh, as an individual active in the field, recognizing the importance of promoting mental health of children within the school context where most children most days beyond the COVID context, most children most days in the United States are at school. So it affords tremendous opportunity. And 
I just wanted to point out that this tremendous interdisciplinary collaborative team that we have here today is amazing. And uh, it's my good fortune to be here with you, uh, recognizing that we have colleagues that who are experts and leaders in the fields of counseling and clinical and school and, and social work and such. So cutting across numerous areas, this is precisely the type of interdisciplinary collaboration that's so critically important. So. Uh, thank you, each of you, for being there with us today, and it's awesome that you will also have an opportunity to collaborate re regularly through the Missouri Prevention Science Institute. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and launch into some of the content here. Oh, and in terms of the agenda today, just to mention, we've got the, uh, the context will be set up and information will be provided about the key contributions of uh, some of the articles that were featured in the recent special topic section uh, within School Psych Review focused on uh, promoting student mental health at school. And there'll be a lot of information shared about takeaways and key lessons that are learned. And so each of our presenters will be sharing information about some of the articles that were featured in the special topic section. And because of the webinar format, you are able to post a question uh, within the question box, which you should be able to access in your menu bar. And generally speaking, we'll likely attend to those. We'll save some time briefly at the end to address uh, questions. But if one of the panelists sees a particular uh, question that's related to the content that they're discussing at the time and they want to, they might choose to uh, address it then. But otherwise, know that we'll have some time at the very end to uh, also address questions. Okay, so we'll go ahead and launch in. I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Herman. Great, thanks. And Shane, thanks for highlighting the multidisciplinary aspect of our work because it's so central to, to what we do. And we, um, we've written articles about that. That wasn't a central focus of the special issue, but it is really fundamental to the work that we do. So, um, so with this special topic, we, we had the good fortune to, to work with Shane and also previously with, I want to acknowledge uh, Amy Rushley and Tanya Eckert for their support in initially launching these ideas. Um, and it was a way for us to bring together a lot of the work that we were doing, but also to connect to colleagues from around the country with some of the other work on this important topic. Next slide, please. So I imagine we're preaching to the choir here in terms of why this is an important topic. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it, but I, th I think these two slides here, uh, or two graphs will um, highlight <clears throat> the importance. One is, that we know that suicide rates among youth are at an all-time high. They've been rising over the past decade in particular. And if you look at the slide on the, the left there, you see that since about 2007, we've had this dramatic escalation in uh, suicide rates for, for youth. And then on the right, we see also the corollary, which is we see a major increase in the uh, number of youth who are experiencing major depressive episodes. Also around the same time period, the first two lines on the top of this graph or, or figure on the right uh, represent youth 12 to 17 and then um, young adults 18 to 25. So it's, it's striking that for adults and for older adults, we see pretty much a flat line. So something in particular is going on for youth in this country uh, related to mental health. And I should also highlight that this is 2017. The uh, data from CDC uh, was recently released around, uh, for um, updated by 2019. We see the, the trends continuing, but all of this is pre-COVID. And we see all this data coming, showing that youth are uh, telling us about high levels of anxiety and other internalizing concerns related to the pandemic. So we might just be looking at the tip of the iceberg and that even if this is a tip, this is bad. And part of one of the calls of our overview article is to say, we're, we're clearly failing youth in our country collectively uh, when we're letting this happen. And so one of the impetuses for this special issue was to say, what are we doing wrong and what can we do better? Next slide, please. So we, we devote a little bit of space in the overview article to this question of what does not work, because I think we have sufficient evidence to rule out some of our strategies that have not been doing the trick. Um, and some of these might surprise you that we included them in what doesn't work. And um, for instance, we call out things like individual therapy and group therapy. And by that, we don't mean to say that they, are, uh, that they don't work at all, but they're not gonna work by themselves to change this trajectory and to, to change these metrics on a population level for uh, youth mental health. They will be part of the solution, but they alone are not gonna um, turn the curve. And, 
the bigger issue for me, and I'll talk on a bit on a soapbox here, and, I, and we got a little bit of a soapbox in, <laughs> in our overview and lessons learned article, but some of the problem is certainly to us the way that we think about mental health. Uh, a lot of times we think it's synonymous with mental illness. Uh, when we think about how we can identify youth, we think about it as something that's happening within the child's head or within the child to the neglect of the context. Uh, and we think to solve the problem, we have to refer out. We identify kids and then we send them to someone who will magically fix them. And that is the type of mentality that's not gonna help youth. Uh, instead, we all need to take responsibility as adults for creating the context that we know, help youth development flourish and to remove those contexts that we know undermine youth development. And so we do spend some time in the overview article also talking about what, what we think works and what we have evidence for. And um, the special issue is really devoted to highlighting aspects of the, these elements that do work. And we describe in the special issue what's referred to as these children tax funds. If you're not aware of them, they're pretty spectacular. There's been at least 10 communities around the country that have created sales tax uh, where um, a certain amount of money that's spent on every item bought in that county gets devoted to uh, this tax fund that uh, generates revenue for supporting youth mental health. We live in a community that did that in 2012. We're not the first, we're not the largest. Uh, St. Louis County did it as well, and their, their tax fund generates about $40 million a year. Ours is about $6 million. Um, but we think what makes ours unique is how it's been uh, administered and um, how the money has been spent. And it's been done in partnership with the university and it's been done strategically and with high levels of accountability. And so we think that serves as a model uh, for other communities that are wanting to pass this. We tried to describe in as much detail as we could how to create these tax funds because we think others will want to know that because there's, there's ways to do it and hopefully other communities will follow suit. And so I can, you can think about the special issue really as having two, two parts. Uh, a, a large part of it is spent uh, focused on the work that we've done here in our county in mid-Missouri and describe seven different elements or strategies that we've used to create this comprehensive model. Some of it here you see is uh, community focused, some is school focused. Uh, you know, I started out with a triangle to describe these <laughs> processes and I just, I couldn't do it. You know, Wendy and I are from the University of Oregon where they say they invented the, ge the geometric shape, the triangle. <laughs> um, not true, of course, but uh, this was my effort to be a little bit more original. This uh, captures more of an ecological uh, framework, but, but the colors are the same where we have these wraparound supports. Hopefully all kids have access to in schools and community universal supports. Um, that includes our, our anti-stigma campaign that we will describe. It, it includes our Family Access Center for Excellence. Um, as well as the coalition that Wendy's going to describe in a moment. You see on the inner circles here, we have uh, tier two sorts of interventions for kids showing early signs of troubles or distress. And then in the middle, in the red, we have more intensive supports for the kids who need the most, most support. Next slide, please. So that, I'll turn that over to Wendy to talk about the, the coalition piece. Great. Yeah, this, this study is an, uh, was an opportunity to really highlight some of the work we've been doing in our community here for the past going on seven years now. Um, and so this is a longitudinal study looking at some um, comprehensive, it's a comprehensive school mental health model that we've been implementing that uses universal screening data that links directly to evidence-based interventions. So I'll go ahead and describe that. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, this is, we call it our School Mental Health Coalition, and we call it that because um, about seven years ago, we passed this mental health tax, and um, providers started infiltrating into our schools and saying, hey, can we get into schools to start seeing kids? And superintendents from across six school districts got together and said, this is, this, if this is happening in my school district, it must be happening in yours. And they started talking, and they brought me in, and we started talking about forming a coalition um, where we could actually provide some evidence-based supports in schools. And so that's what we did. Um, and some of the things that we do across, it's across 55 school buildings and six school districts. We do um, universal screening uh, using something we call the early identification system, where we do get both student and teacher report on um, 
items of risk that we know that are directly associated with mental health problems or later mental health problems. Um, that screening then informs our universal, um, uh, universal prevention interventions that we do in schools as well as individual supports. And we link it directly to this menu of options um, that, so for each construct, there are um, evidence-based interventions that schools have access to and can select. And what we did with this study was actually look at um, how schools were implementing uh, based on a fidelity measure that we have and what student outcomes look like. Next slide, please. So our early identification system um, picks up um, indicators across these seven constructs. So we're looking at academic and attention issues, peer relationship issues, externalizing behaviors, internalizing behaviors, emotional dysregulation, school disengagement, and bullying behavior. So it's very comprehensive. And um, each of those areas, we now have some associated evidence-based interventions that schools can implement. And um, they also um, are indicators for later uh, mental health risk. And so the teacher checklist, so teachers in grades uh, kindergarten through 12th grade all complete this they, using the exact same items. And it takes them about 10 to 15 minutes. And we also have a student version, which is self-report for grades three through 12. And that takes students about five to 10 minutes. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a screenshot of what our student version looks like. Um, so we have a total of, I think, 38 questions that they go through and they click on each one and, and um, rate always, often, sometimes, or never. And next slide, please. And then here's what our teacher checklist looks like. And this one, um, this was developed by Aaron Thompson years ago. And it's just a quick and dirty um, way for teachers to indicate which students in their classroom have risk in different areas. And so across the top, you'll see the students' names are listed. And then there's um, a series of items that the teacher just goes through and set, clicks yes, if that's a risk for that student and leaves it blank if it's not. So it's very quick. It takes classroom teachers about 10 to 15 minutes to do this. Next slide, please. Um, once the, um, the early identification system cycle closes, schools get back reports that we've tried to create in a way that are super easy for them to understand what the next steps are. So this is a student report. And so what comes back is what you're looking at is the red, yellow, green is indicating what percentage of students are in each of these categories. So low risk means that they, the students said never or, or sometimes for an item. And then if it's yellow, that means that they're saying um, often. And if it's red, they're saying always. And so when we give this report back to schools, we tell them if you have, um, if one of these areas, there's 20% or more students who are saying that this is an issue for them, then you wanna do something at, that's universal. You don't wanna do one kid at a time. This is a problem for a larger group of people or kids in your school. So let's do a universal prevention intervention. Um, and so that's how these school level reports are used. Next slide, please. We also get individual reports. So schools can look at grade level reports, they can look at school level, they can also dig down into um, individual reports. And then we have the same system, red, yellow, green, um, where if something's in the red, that means that's something that needs attention. And so we tend to link these um, individual reports to either like a group-based intervention or an individualized intervention. And someone just asked if the early identification system is commercially available. It currently is not. Um, it's, it's part of some work that we're doing with our National Center for Rural School Mental Health, which we're gonna be pushing out to nationally to um, rural schools. Um, but if you're interested in it, you can contact us and we can talk more about that. Um, next slide, please. So now that schools have reports and they know what is read, and so we're saying um, you need to do something universally, you need to do a group intervention, you need to do an individual intervention based on what's read on the reports, we try to link that directly to evidence-based interventions. So um, the National Center for Rural School Mental Health on its website, it's gonna launch in May, we'll have something we call an EIS hub, intervention hub. And so if you, administer the checklist and let's say you pop on 
externalizing behaviors and it's a classroom level or grade level um, problem, then you would click on externalizing behaviors. There's a button you can click on for classroom and it'll link you to a menu of different possible interventions. So in this case, we're linking to the classroom checkup, which is an evidence-based intervention to support um, teachers in classroom management. And so we just try to make it that take out some of the human error so that we're linking directly to evidence-based interventions. Next slide, please. And so what we did with this study is we took some of the student uh, report data across, um, across three years, so looked at it longitudinally. We did growth mixture modeling to see what types of trajectories we found within, the, within our data. And so here um, you can see that we found four different uh, trajectories. So there's the majority of students are in that low stable. So it's about 78% of students are predictably like just low and not have it showing a lot of risk, which is what you would expect. Then there's a group that is consistently high stable. So that's about 11% of our population. Then we have this, this nice group that shows a decreasing trend over time, and that's about five to 6%, but we also have a group that's increasing. And so one of the things we did was we, we found these trajectories and then we said, does this link to uh, fidelity of, of the model? And what we found was it does. Um, actually that increasing um, class is more likely to be in a low fidelity school. And so um, basically what we're finding is that if, you, if you're in a school where you're doing this um, model with high fidelity, you have fewer kids who have an increasing class over time. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> um, next slide. All right, so I'll hand this off to Dr. Thompson. Thank you, nice job, Wendy. Um, so this is, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Family Access Center of Excellence um, that all four of us are, are involved with. Um, and this was this has been a culmination of oh gosh is it five going on six years of work that we have uh, put together a center that really is um, kind of the uh, high response center for high needs kids and families in our county. So if Wendy's um, co what Wendy just talked about with the coalition model is really the universal approach to try to get services to all kids in the county, FACE is really that high indicated level. Um, uh, service access point. Um, there are many barriers uh, we all know to accessing quality mental health services and, and, and FACE was specifically designed from the get-go by not only ourselves but a whole host of community stakeholders to, to overcome these barriers. Next slide please Jane. Jane. <clears throat> so um, at many agencies uh, treatment's only provided to the person referred. So if a child's referred to an agency, they're gonna be the focus of the treatment. At FACE, we focus really on the families. And so any family in our county or area, the tax permits that we can service free of charge to that family. Um, and we do this uh, through the family checkup, which is an evidence-based model, similar to wraparound or, or school family partnerships. Um, it's it's assessment driven. Um, it looks at not only the child's functioning, but also the family's functioning across multiple domains. Um, and then we provide brief feedback to the child and the family. Uh, this leads to an action plan with measurable goals and existing community services that our families are linked to. And then we follow up with them on an ongoing basis. Um, next slide, please. Overall goal is just to get families into services, just get them involved and engaged in services uh, with their children um, or getting the child involved. Um, one of the reasons that FACE was developed was uh, we had a high level of disproportionate contact of youth of color and law enforcement as well as courts in our community. That was publicly uh, inf public information, and it was something the community was highly motivated to, to do something about. And so that was part of the nepotus of, of developing FACE. Um, FACE is really seen as kind of the, the hub of a lot of the services that are funded by the children's mental health tax here that Keith talked about. Um, 
but largely the the, the fate, all of our clinicians at FACE, which includes social workers, counselors, uh, psychologists, um, they're all trained in evidence-based engagement strategies like motivational interviewing, which is an aspect of the family checkup, really helps to focus, uh, focus a family on what matters, reducing ambivalence to change. And in this present study, we really wanted to look at and know if youth referred from schools, which at the time of this study made up about 68% of our referrals during the year that we're gonna look at, we wanna know if those youth referred from schools were, were benefiting from FACE services. Next, please. So we isolated youth referred from schools, um, 52 schools in our county. So about a total of 417 youth that were referred between June 1st of, of 2017 and May 31st, 2018, an entire 12-month academic year, basically. Out of those 417 youth, 224 elected to engage with FACE services, and 193 did not. Um, when we looked at these youth, most of who were referred by school support personnel, when we looked at these youth or compared both of these groups, we did see that their prior measures in, in their uh, previous year in terms of school outcomes, that they were roughly equivalent. Um, there were no significant differences on attendance or academic performance on uh, office disciplinary referrals or, or um, exclusionary discipline. We didn't see any differences between these groups either on demographics. And so we proceeded to um, use a fixed regression model and included all those prior year performances to look at the subsequent year outcomes. Um, and and inter interesting, it's, it's kind of challenging because we're using static outcomes or fixed outcomes, but really when you talk about a, a, a case management or a referral to a case management agency, the, the, the treatment variable moves. And some families were involved with FACE for a longer period of time, some families for a shorter period of time. So we ended up using kind of a dosage variable that was a total number of days of count that a, that a family was involved with FACE. The average was around 157 days. Um, and of course, our comparison group of 193 kids had a FACE days um, variable uh, number of zero. So next, next slide, please. What we saw between uh, the differences on these youth and when we looked at their uh, outcomes was we saw that students who were involved with FACE had fewer social emotional risk factors. To do this, we used the coalition um, EIS, early identification scores that teachers rated students on. Uh, we saw that students had, that were involved with FACE had better attendance, fewer office referrals, exclusionary discipline, and incredibly higher standardized math scores for this year. So that was very interesting to see. Next slide, please. So this is a quasi-experimental study. So there are a lot of unknowns with this. For example, it's really hard to, we did not model the number of services that youth were referred to or families were connected with. So there's a lot of variation that's not accounted for there. Um, and so we just treated this as a rough evaluation of were these youth doing better or were they not? Um, and so we know, though, that a lot of families that are that are high have a lot of high needs or, or have a lot of problems that they often receive services from other places too. And we we did not model for those kinds of issues either. But ultimately, we we're seeing pretty consistent improvements in school-based outcomes from youth referred from schools, and so that was promising as a as a quasi-experimental study. Um, and also, most importantly noted, youth of color were more likely to be referred to FACE, which is important because we know national trends on exclusionary discipline with youth of color is an alarming rate, um, and it was a good positive uh, thing to see in our community. So I think I'm talking on the next few studies here. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> this one is on a look around. Can, this one is called the Look Around Boone Campaign. It's a social media campaign that was developed by several uh, folks in our community, including university researchers, as well as um, people that worked in mental health agencies in the community, our public health um, department. And we were concerned about 
um, youth really wanting to drive them into seeking services. So one of the things we had to combat is some of the stigma that's associated with mental health, as well as um, increasing or making youth um, understand where they can get access to help, but also just destigmatizing help seeking. So that was the purpose of, of the Look Around campaign. Next slide, please. So ultimately, we used, again, the EIS. We have a couple of questions on the EIS, at least in our county, um, that ask youth about uh, their attitudes around stigma and help seeking. And we looked at just using paired t-tests, comparing their fall scores before the look around campaign materials rolled out uh, to their spring scores or their ratings. Um, we captured data from uh, about 11,500 students in grades six through 12. And this was where the media campaign was largely focused on these youth. Um, we, the, the, cam, the campaign content included social media posts, um, banners on Facebook, included Instagram. Uh, it was all over the place in terms of social media. We also uh, had content in our local movie theaters, just little short five minute spots beforehand, um, short clippets uh, on YouTube. It was, it was interesting the ways that you can connect with youth in this content, as well as measure uh, original views um, and, and kind of get an understanding about how widespread the information um, gets cast. Um, we also then looked at using a composite by combining the EIS items into a single composite. And we used a regression model to look at pre and post test change and stigma and help seeking is factored by race to see if we saw any differences in race categories amongst our youth and our community. And then we looked at um, and divided the sample by high above average change as well as low or below average change. And, uh, and we looked to see if there were differences in attendance and other school outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> What we ended up seeing was we did see significant reductions in attitudes or improvements in attitudes around stigma, as well as willingness to seek help among youth in our county. These were small effect sizes, um, but important nonetheless. And what we, I think, more importantly saw was that we, when we looked at factoring the amount of change by race, we see this almost stratified uh, moderation effect um, by youth of color with white youth experiencing the, the uh, highest starting averages and also the most amount of change, but also then um, black youth in our community that were experiencing the least amount of change. And this has kind of driven us to really look at the campaign messaging and engage youth uh, in our community uh, around how we can make that content um, a little more uh, engaging for youth of color. Next slide, please. So really, this was a pretty easy strategy to implementing um, messaging across the community. And, and really, we have these things going on in schools, and then we have a community clinic in FACE. We really want to promote this idea of reducing stigma around mental health with youth, but also driving them um, to seek help if they feel like they need help, normalizing the fact that if you need help. And so that was the whole uh, purpose of the Look Around campaign. And I think the most important finding here is we saw um, discrepancies in the amount of change uh, for youth of color compared to white youth. This has been seen in other uh, studies of social media campaigns of similar messaging. And so I think that um, this comports with other things we've seen previously and, and using that as a, as a wedge to try to understand how we can improve some of this messaging. So, and then my last, Study next slide, please. Here, Aaron, I'm going to give you a tall order. Can oh, you do nice. can Can you do smarts in one minute or less? I will. I will. <laughs> so, thanks, Keith. Going to put the gas on. So, this is an intervention, a school based intervention. It's a self monitoring intervention that I developed as a principal school social worker. Um, we were really interested in uh, looking at uh, how we implemented this in school settings. It was a U.S. Department of Education funded study. Um, and we were really wanting to know if we uh, engage school counselors as natural implementers, if it had any effect on their ability to implement with fidelity, and if that actually translated to improvements in student learning. You can slip to the next slide, Shane. 
Um, and ultimately, what we were seeing is that um, counselors were very engaged with the process when we really focused on the core intervention materials, but then allowed them to have input on how they changed some of the surface elements. So with the study that had to do with how they arranged groups, uh, when they scheduled their groups and on the intervention materials, they had input on the language and some of the look and feel of the intervention materials, but not the core elements. You can slip on through there a little bit, Shane. I'm kind of speeding this one up. So we had about um, 23 elementary school counselors that participated in some focus groups. They really felt engaged with the process. Um, they really liked the fact that they got to have input on the materials themselves. What we saw was also a high correlation um, with student engagement and uh, also um, participation in sessions that translated into better student outcomes. And so I think that was the important part here is using a participatory action research process to look at engaging counselors and also using kind of that co-production framework to allow them to have some input on the materials. So maybe I'll just stop there with that summary and uh, let Kristen go on. Probably have to skip ahead a couple there. Thank you. Yeah, get to where it says show me first. Thank you. Yeah, so I'd like to share about show me first. Um, another project that grew out of this academic community partnership. So with this early identification system in operation, schools were able to identify the youth at risk for social emotional behavioral concerns. They were also implementing additional mental health support, some referrals for these youths, but schools felt it was still not fully addressing the needs for youths with internalizing concerns. At the same time, I was involved, also tax supported effort to provide training and evidence-based practices for school and community-based providers in our area. So school providers, um, Sarah Owens, Jenna Strong, working in the schools approached me and we talked about the problem. So the EIS was helping them identify these youths. Um, the schools had great dedicated providers who could work with them and were already providing social emotional curricula, skills groups, but their specialized training and in internalizing interventions was more limited. And frankly, they didn't have much time for additional training. So whatever intervention we added needed to be something they could learn in a brief period. Um, they didn't have a week to spend in training like many research supported interventions require. Um, on top of this, whatever intervention we chose had to be delivered during the school day without taking the youths out of a lot of important academic work. So from here, we decided upon adapting a research supported intervention called BURST, developed by John Wise and Sarah Kate Beerman. We truncated it by covering each evidence-based skill in just one short meeting um, to make sure that this was a worthwhile program before moving forward with wide scale implementation, we decided to do a small randomized trial of Show Me First in area middle schools to look at its feasibility and efficacy. Next slide. So um, Show Me First was adapted from first. So that intervention requires a decision tree, multiple days of training, ongoing consultation to cover evidence-based skills that um, that I show you here, and many of you will recognize these. These skills show up again and again and again in research supported interventions for use with the most common mental health concerns. Find your feelings is essentially feelings identification and monitoring, systematic problem solving skills, relaxation training, scan your thoughts is basically cognitive coping, cognitive restructuring. Finally, try the opposite is essentially alternative action. So for anxiety and avoidance, this amounts to exposure. Um, for depression and withdrawal, this amounts to behavioral activation and activity scheduling. So we provided a really brief training for counselors who then implemented this intervention with the highest risk youths who were randomly assigned to either get the usual services or show me first. Next slide. So what did we find? So show me first largely seemed to be quite feasible with just a half day training, no additional consultation. Um, the school providers were able to deliver these five components within seven sessions, showing pretty good fidelity to four of the five components. <laughs> Unfortunately, the fifth component, alternative action, what many would argue um, is probably the most critical component for depression and anxiety, that did not achieve high fidelity. Um, in terms of efficacy, Show Me First did show significant pre-post change with um, effects in the medium to large range, so that was good. The superiority to usual care, however, did not reach statistical significance. So the providers, the youths really liked this program. They wanted to keep using it, but they felt like they just needed more um, 
support and more flexibility to really extend the treatment in order to fully cover all five components. Uh, next slide. So what are the takeaways? Where do we go next? Um, the schools really want this as an option, but we've seen that we really need in this work to carefully balance making the intervention more practical by reducing training time, reducing delivery time against what really seems to be needed to maximize efficacy. So providing some more training support, allowing more sessions for the highest risk youth. So in this next year, we're planning to supplement the half day training with some optional consultation um, and really encourage use of a measurement feedback system actually that I wanna show you now, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, this dedicated sales tax supports ongoing training and support for any interested um, provider through formal um, CE granting workshops covering research supported interventions, ongoing consultation, access to research supported treatment manuals, and a measurement feedback system. Next slide. So this measurement feedback system, Missouri Therapy Tractor, is some Missouri Therapy Tracker, excuse me, is something we've developed in our testing here. It combines session by session monitoring and feedback on um, adherence to evidence-based practices for the most common youth mental health concerns, alliance and hope that therapy is helping, a standardized broad-based symptom measure of internalizing and externalizing concerns, and an individualized top problems assessment. It's brief. You can do all of it in under five minutes. You can also tailor it so you can choose which measures to include and who to have actually complete it. There are therapists, caregiver, and youth reports available. And I wanna just really quickly, um, next slide, show you an example feedback report, um, but you're welcome to ask me more about it later, check it out online or email me. So here's a feedback report. It shows you in the first section what you did in session that's consistent with the evidence base for that youth's target problems. It also gives you suggestions for other things, other research supported interventions to try in the future that you haven't yet included. It lets you know when there are discrepancies between what the therapist, the youth, and the caregiver reports happened in session. And it lets you know how they view the therapy relationship and how hopeful they are about therapy helping them. Next slide. Um, it also gives you simple graphs. So again, we're using this red, yellow, green color system um, that seems to be pretty straightforward and easy to understand. So you can see on the left how the youth is doing on a norm referenced scale. On the right, you can see how the youth is doing um, according to each reporter with their own personally identified top problems. So our hope is that this will really boost the efficacy of treatment, so maximizing both the use of evidence-based um, interventions, but also providing what is also proving to be um, a really helpful intervention, which is ongoing measurement-based care monitoring and feedback, um, while still being feasible and practical for school providers. So that's what I wanted to share today. And you can go to the next slide and I think our next article. Yeah, and I would just uh, say about Kristen's work, one of the important pieces is that um, it's not just about access. Sometimes people make that mistake, just get kids access to care. Unfortunately, we know that the quality of care is very, very variable. Um, and so what Kristen has done with this work is really have elevated the quality of care in our community so that when we are accessing services for youth, uh, there's a good chance that it's gonna be re really high quality services. So I just wanna spend the last couple minutes here. I wanna leave some time for questions just to highlight really quickly, um, whet your appetite for some of the other articles and special issues so you can delve into them if, if they pique your interest. So this first one is um, Mars Mentoring Program, which is a motivational interviewing and mentoring program for youth in alternative school settings. Uh, this was developed by Lauren Henry, who's spectacular. She's at Children's Hospital of Colorado. If you're really interested in this, I'm sure she would love to share resources with you and talk, talk to you about it. Next slide. But Lauren developed this as a doctoral student. She developed the program. She um, did a randomized trial. She actually did several studies of it while she was here. Uh, this is just describing her dissertation. Um, she, we know that kids in alternative school setting are at highest risk and a high percentage of kids actually end up experiencing alternative school placements. And yet there's really little empirical evidence showing what works for kids in these settings. She developed this intervention specifically for them. Next slide. So she did this randomized trial with 39 students. These studies are always a small sample because they tend to be small groups of kids in a given building. Um, but what she found, um, just brief summary of all these um, 
tables is she found large effects for kids who received the Mars mentor mentoring program on their behavioral outcomes by teacher and student report on office discipline referrals and on, on academic assessments with a you know, relatively low intensity, but um, very strong autonomy support intervention for students in these settings. So we think this is a really promising intervention for alternative schools. Next slide. We also have a school-based psychiatry program that's been supported by this tax fund. Next slide. And I just wanna highlight that this was developed by, again, the interdisciplinary focus, uh, Lane Young Walker, who's a psychiatrist in our community on the right there. She is spectacular. She's there with Carol Schultz, who's a nurse practitioner who helps implement the program. Uh, in this one, we just evaluated the sustained effects of this program, which has now been in existence for, I think, four years. And what we found is that uh, we continued, the, the key idea here is that in our community, there was a, a long wait term for kids to access uh, psychiatry care because we have a psychiatry shortage. So Dr. Young Walker placed psychiatrists in schools to, to serve as a bridge until they, uh, these students could get access to a full-time psychiatric care. And what she's shown is that it, they serve high needs kids. 70% um, of the kids are at or below the poverty line. And she does it in a way that achieves the same types of success uh, as typical to psychiatric care that kids are able to access where kids are benefiting by parent and teacher report. Next slide. The last three articles of the special issue uh, take this lens to a national focus. And so just briefly wanted to make you aware of the, this work by our colleagues at Georgia State University. This is a statewide school mental health program that they evaluated using propensity score matching. They had a large sample of schools. Uh, and this model involves, I think it's called APEX. They put school, um, uh, psych psychologists and counselors in buildings to provide both preventive and uh, more intensive individualized supports. And what they showed is over time, uh, these schools had a positive impact on school climate, uh, especially in discipline incidents over, incidents over time relative to schools that did not have this model in place. So this is a very encouraging large scale model. Next slide, please. Our colleagues at um, Johns Hopkins, University of Virginia, Arizona State did this uh, study that took this important question, which is what are the benefits cost analysis wise of implementing behavioral health initiatives? They looked at PBIS, they had done a really large scale study with PBIS, and then they tried to translate the benefits that were observed in academic performance and behavior into real dollars that schools were saving as a result of these changes. And just glancing at these, the largest cost savings from PBIS they found were due to the improvements that were observed in student academic performance, 140,000 roughly for elementary school students. There are also cost saving benefits for improvements in aggressive disruptive behaviors and also reductions in suspensions. Um, so this is an important way to start thinking about if we're advocating for these services, how they are beneficial, not only to the kids, but also to real dollars and cents that can be invested in other ways. And then finally, this work uh, is from our colleagues at University of South Carolina. Mark Wiest and his colleagues uh, have been at the forefront of policy initiatives in school mental health for decades now. And as you see, South Carolina now has 60% uh, of their schools have added mental health clinicians and they're gonna be at 100% within a few years because of policy initiatives. And so this paper really describes the work that they've done and the specific policy initiatives that they advanced to make this happen. And then next slide, I think it's our last slide here. Overall, you know, the take home messages here are that these comprehensive approaches at, at scale do work. Uh, and, and we think we know some of the elements that have to be in place. I'll reiterate this important, this idea of the importance of correcting misperceptions of mental health. In, our, in the last article on the special issue, the lessons learned piece, we, we actually advance our own definition, which is mental health is a quality of fit between person and environment that promotes an individual's adaptive development and functioning in society, as well as a personal sense of well-being. We really wanna emphasize that all adults have responsibility for helping elevate the mental health of, of youth in the school and in the community. Um, two final points, this work requires system change implementers throughout. And there's just not enough skilled people who can provide the technical assistance that schools are gonna to need to do this. 
And so school psychologists can and, and they should be, and they are at the forefront of this, but we need to train more people uh, to, to be good system change implementers. And then finally, um, throughout this, you know, attending to the role of culture is essential to implementation and outcomes. We saw that with our anti-stigma campaign. We need to collect ongoing information across different aspects of culture and race and ethnicity to make sure that our efforts are having their intended effect. I think that's it. Excellent. Uh, that was fantastic. Tons of great information in such a limited amount of time. So grateful for each of the presenters in really diligently attending to um, summarizing and synthesizing so much valuable information. And again, in such a limited amount of time, they did a great job and they preserved uh, about 10 minutes here to uh, get a few questions in before our time together expires today. I did note that there were a couple of questions. I know Dr. Rinke had uh, answered one on the fly. Somehow she's uh, doing <laughs> that amazing multitasking of being able to present, monitor the chat and answer the question, which is above and beyond. But uh, there were a couple of other questions. I know uh, in our question and answers box, uh, Catherine, uh, had asked, is there training provided for the interventions that you link to? And I think she asked that question early on. I think Catherine asked that question early on. So I don't know if one of you has a response to it or maybe multiple of you. Uh, is there training provided for the interventions that you link to? Yeah, currently in our model, um, because we have this text fund, we have we have a whole army of um, school psychologists, social workers, counselors who are out in the schools working with the data and um, providing interventions, and also providing professional development on the interventions. Um, so it's really it's a nice luxury. Um, but what we're building um, with the rural center is um, having a lot of online uh, trainings that are connected to the interventions that we have on our hub. So there'll be videos and um, different, just different summaries of what needs, the steps need to be in place to do that. So, yeah. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Hong had asked a question uh, a little bit later, just saying, thank you for organizing the webinar. They found it very helpful. They said that they're, uh, I am planning to do a district-wide intervention research. Could you talk about your IRB process, especially the parental consent portion? A great question. This, I, I'm assuming this isn't particularly related to the coalition checklist. And this is uh, something that we worked with our district partners and lawyers ab about for several years. Um, the key idea here is that this data belongs to the schools. They're doing it universally. And that our measure is not diagnostic. We're not diagnosing disorders, we are uh, describing risk conditions. And so it's been deemed uh, more of a program evaluation. It's not a research study. And with regard to that, our districts have opted to simply use a parent opt-out procedure where they let parents know uh, that the screening is taking place. They give them a tool to access if they don't want their child to participate, but that requires an active opt-out on the parent part. Uh, and, and this process has, allows us to screen 95 to 99% of students, uh, whereas if we were requiring a parent consent process, we would have maybe 50% uh, participation. That's so critically important. I appreciate you sharing that information, Dr. Herman, and uh, knowing that uh, various colleagues throughout the country who have been advocating and implementing universal screening, as, as you folks have there, that, that it's complicated. It's not just so simple as declaring it to be so, or you know, one person deciding that uh, appreciate how you shared about having the collaboration, the communications, the council, you know, basically determining a way to do this that uh, really does emphasize that this is a tremendous opportunity to help uh, potentially benefit all children. Uh, and especially as we, as I noted at the beginning, where in the US, most children most days are at school. And so this type of universal screening that you folks are engaged in and some other colleagues uh, in other regions of the country, uh, tremendously important. And especially as to address internalizing, externalizing, behavioral, social, emotional, mental health challenges uh, broadly beyond, you know, even addition to reading and math, for instance. So that's really valuable. 
Uh, I wanna encourage participants again, as we're coming down to our last few minutes, if anyone else had a question they wanted to ask, uh, you can post it in the question and answers, the Q&A portion. I know some folks are putting comments into the chat. Uh, there is a question, uh, this is a question from uh, Patricia says, uh, thank you so much for the webinar. I'm looking forward to reading the articles. Excellent. And could you talk about the process you used to get a children's tax fund established? That was really valuable information you began presenting at the beginning, Dr. Herman. And I know you wrote about it a bit in the articles, but maybe if you could just speak to this a bit more, what's the process you use to get the children's tax fund established? Yeah, I think more details uh, are definitely in that article, but just in brief, uh, we, the four of us didn't pass the tax, just to be clear. <laughs> this was a community effort and it was really driven by uh, the early childhood advocates in our community because they really understood the importance of this. Um, and it was, a, it was over about a decade period of time. There was opposition to the tax, as you would imagine, and it appeared on multiple ballots, but the, the last time it appeared on the ballot, 2012, there was no opposition. They wore them down uh, and it actually passed by a relative landslide in our community. I think 58, 59% said yes on it. Um, so I think each state is a little different. In Missouri, there was legislation that allowed municipalities to create their own sales tax. And that was added in, I think the year 2000. Uh, I recently saw, I think Denver passed a similar tax. So I think there's this uh, combination between what your state legislature or laws allow um, a given municipality to do, but I think there's lots of opportunities for people to pursue that. Excellent, thank you. Another question that popped up, we just in our last few minutes here, Jacqueline asks, uh, for the therapy tracker tool, are the students able to track their scores to development uh, self-monitoring skills? So through, so I, and I'm not sure if that one was about the tracker or about the EIS checklist. Therapy, therapy tracker. Therapy tracker. So with both of them, um, we really very much encourage the provider working with the child, with the youth, to be sharing scores with them and to be looking at graphs together. We don't actually, though, provide youths with a way to just on their own be looking at their scores. They always do it with their, um, with their provider. And similarly, uh, even though I, I guess that wasn't what the question about, was about, with the universal screening, the EIS system, they... Um, when they go through additional screening, if they're going to reference their scores, they'll do that with um, a school-based personnel as well. Excellent. I did I did shortchange Aaron. Uh, this really could be <laughs> perfectly aligned with his intervention. You wanna say it's one sentence about that, Aaron? Just that uh, they, the intervention, the SMARTS intervention is really about students self-monitoring um, their own progress on goals in schools and getting feedback from teachers. Um, I think if there's one theme through a lot of what we have talked about today, it's really about feedback and the quality of getting feedback into the hands of school partners or students or teachers, um, parents, and, and, and that that leads to formative change. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, to each of our participants, our panelists here for presenting as well. So many appreciative comments that were in the chat today. I know the panelists are busy presenting information, but I just wanted to highlight that. So again, a great big round of applause to all. We're grateful, so informative, so engaging, inspiring, and uh, really tremendous uh, contributions, uh, both among the panelists, as well as the many other authors who contributed to this uh, SPR special issue. So encouraging colleagues to go out, students as well as practitioners. Also just wanna highlight that as I recall, uh, this uh, particular project that was in Missouri got a shout out from uh, Michelle Obama, as I recall, uh, seen. And so that's awesome. There's very few instances where the good work we're doing in the schools gets the attention of uh, the first lady. So uh, congrats uh, to each of you on that uh, front as well. And uh, hopefully, each of you will be accessing the articles, as we mentioned, but also this webinar will be posted on the School Psychology Review YouTube channel. So you can check that out, as well as many of the uh, articles do include the 122nd summaries, which will be posted over this next month. There's already a few of them from this special topic section that are listed. There'll be others forthcoming. And that's where the authors are sharing in two minutes the key questions the key results and the key implications. And so again, having so many practitioners and students participating today, as well as faculty, really emphasizes 
the tremendous opportunity for us to bring science to practice to help benefit children and families and schools. So again, want to thank our panelists, Dr. Herman, Dr. Rinke, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Holly, for your contributions over the past few years and working on this special topic section, as well as past few decades in your science and your scholarship and today's session as well. So thank you very much. And thank you for all the participants. And we're just out of time. So folks can do the Zoom shuffle to head off to another session. <laughs> thank, you. Right. Thanks, great thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Yeah, great to see you.